Okay, last week we left off looking at agricultural development and the role that agriculture has to play in the full development of any country in the global south. Today we're picking up, still dealing with the same topic, but this time we're looking at environmental issues and development. And you're going to see that everything that we've talked about before still comes into play again here as we deal with the issue of the environment. Because now we're going to specifically look at the environment. Whatever is going to occur in development is occurring within some environmental setting. And we're going to start this not by delving immediately into the issues like uh, ecology, sustainable development, and all of the technical stuff that we're going to look at. But we're going to start it by looking at exactly what is nature, what is the environment. So when we're talking the environment, when we're talking about how humans interact with their environment, we need to start with an understanding of what exactly do we mean by the environment? What exactly do we mean by nature? And to do that, I brought an African scholar, Maladoma Patrice Somme, and the book I have here is his book, The Healing Wisdom of Africa, Finding Life Purpose Through Nature, Ritual, and Community. So now, Somme kicks us off real interestingly with an understanding of what nature is all about. He says that ritual, community, and healing these three are so intertwined in the indigenous world that to speak of one is to speak of them all. Ritual or community, commu ritual, communally designed, helps the individual remember his or her purpose, and such remembering brings healing both to the individual and the community. The community exists in part to safeguard the purpose of each person within it and to awaken the memory of that purpose by recognizing the unique gifts each individual brings to this world. Healing comes when the individual remembers his or her identity, the purpose chosen in the world of ancestral wisdom, and reconnects with that world of spirit. Human beings long for connection, and our sense of usefulness derives from the feeling of connection. When we are connected to our own purpose, to the community around us, and to our spiritual wisdom, we are able to live and act with authentic effectiveness. In an African definition, an African city, nature automatically is, is a natural part of us. We are a natural part of nature. And what he's putting out here is that when we're dealing with those three, we're looking at ritual, community, and healing that brings us into balance. So in order for there, from an African perspective, for there to actually be, actually be development, then there must be an understanding of who we are as far as identity is concerned and who we are in relation to the community. Because in the African context, when defining community, you automatically include the environment. It's a natural part. There's no separation. The reason there can be environmental issues is because in the Western model of development, the environment is something that you conquer, something that you control in the Western sense. We'll take an example from the global south. Bolivia. Bolivia passed the law, made it a part of the Constitution that the rights of the environment must be protected. All indigenous peoples anywhere in the world consider nature to be alive and consider nature to be a natural part of their everyday life. So the people of Bolivia, the indigenous people, because the Spanish, the Spanish descendants who controlled Bolivia from its independence in the 1800s, until 2000, early 2000, they had no concern. Being a European people, they had no concern for the environment or something you control, something you dominate. But when Bolivia uh, elected its first indigenous president, 
And he and his constituency then immediately wrote into law the necessity of protecting the rights of nature. What that means for the people of Bolivia is that there may be something that is going to improve the material well-being of the community, but they will not do it if it is going to harm the environment which they have to live in. Because remember, whatever we do to develop is going to have some impact, some effect on the environment. And therefore, just because it may be quote unquote good for us, when the scholars sit down and engage in their research, in Bolivia at least, they have to also consider the impact on the environment and if it is it worth our doing. For example, if you use that mode of reasoning, then if that mode of reasoning were used in the West, then no one would have ever bothered to split the app. See, in the West, they studied physics. First, they had a mechanistic view of physics. Then they began to improve. And following the uh, theories of Einstein, they moved into a quantum perspective of physics. So once they got into that level of thinking, then it, you, know, you could theorize and see that it's possible to split an app. But no one ever asked the question, should you split the app? See, in the West, people will, for instance, because they looked at the atom and they're making energy, they said, well, nuclear energy. But no one ever asked the question, should you do this? Just because you can do something, doesn't that mean you should do it? So then when we use indigenous knowledge, when we look at nature as being alive, when we look at ourselves as being an integral part of nature, then you automatically ask the question, should this be done? How is this going to affect nature? In the West, they are now realizing that a lot of the things that they have done and have called development have been inimical, inimic, have been detrimental to human life. Detrimental, and we're going to look at some of those things. So now that Dr. Soleil is beginning us to give us a deeper connectedness, a deeper understanding, and to bring us into a sense of connectedness with nature. We are all connected to nature. The very air that we are breathing is the result of those trees and the plants that are out there right now. So there's a natural connection. And that's what Maladona Sumer brings us into with uh, his opening piece. And then the next part he says, nature is the foundation of indigenous life. Well, think about it. Not just indigenous peoples like the people of Bolivia, like the people of Africa. Nature is not just the foundation of their life, it's the foundation of everybody's life. If we take away what we consider nature, we don't exist. So it's a natural foundation. He says that without nature, the concepts of community, purpose, and healing would be meaningless. No nature, no idea of what community is. Well, let's think about it. There are no trees. If there's no oxygen. You're not breathing. We're not alive. There's no community. We have to have nature in order for it to be a part of us. Consider this. We just had the uh, massive amounts of rain. And so now, the rain is obviously necessary. No food, you got some other issues. No crops coming, no water to drink, all of these different things. You know, we can look at it in so many different ways. And you don't even have to get very big or technical to understand the importance of the environment that we are existing in to our very existence. We don't exist without the environment. Now once again, Western scholars in development they generally do not engage in the discussion of nature in the manner that we're beginning it here now. Because they see nature as a thing to be controlled. That you can use for your own purposes. But if you view nature as being alive, then you have a different understanding of this situation and a different understanding of what development actually is. 
The idea of a person born with a purpose, a purpose that needs to be supported by an active community presence, and the idea of working with subtle energies for balance and healing would be only grandiose notions in the absence of nature as a playground. When we talk development, we're talking about building a community. And all we're saying is that if you just pull away nature, all of that other stuff is foolish. Think about it. No nature, no religion, no spirit, no nothing. Any aspect of your life that is of importance, take away nature, it is no good. Now, so may take us to indigenous knowledge. Now I'm going to take us a few thousand years backwards into the Nile Valley. Early civilization, Nile Valley, Nubia, Kush, Kenya, or what you know as Egypt. They had a turn. That turn, remember, uh, if you are familiar with the uh, writing system, the Meta Meta from ancient Egypt, they did not write the vowels. So they had a turn. N T R. We normally, for ease of pronunciation, put some letters in there. Net. The concept nature in ancient Egypt was the concept that represented what we call God. Also, some scholars will tell you that the Egyptian concept of nature finds its way through the Greek into the Latin and you get the word natura, from which we get our term nature. So what they were telling us 10,000 years ago was that everything that we see out here is a representation of God. And so whatever we do to anything that is around us, we are in effect doing that to God. And since we are a representation of God according to this, according to the teaching they're providing us, then whatever we do out there is going to ricochet back on us. Whatever we do to the environment, we have done to ourselves. So this is taking us into a deeper meaning. Now, when we, last week, several the past few weeks, we talked about, we mentioned repeatedly, indigenous or uh, pre-colonial African development. Pre-colonial African development begins with this understanding of the environment. It begins here. That's the understanding of the environment. So when you look at pre-colonial Africa, you see balanced societies that were living in harmony with the environment and were not seeking to control the environment. Completely total difference here. Whereas the Western concept that was imposed has a concept of the environment, a concept of nature, as something to be controlled that you are constantly in conflict with nature. That's the Western concept. And you have to get to the philosophical foundations when you're dealing with any issues. Because if you don't, you just automatically get started like the textbooks do. This is what the books do. They say environmental issues are developed. And then they'll tell you things like Types of environmental degradation and contributing factors, environmental sustainable development, environmental conservation, sustainability, and impact assessment. They'll just take you straight into that. But if you don't get to the philosophical understanding, you'll never really have a deep understanding of what the issue actually is, then you can't solve it. Because if there's going to be development in Tanzania, you have to have a deep understanding of what you mean by the environment. Because how you view the environment is going to determine the type of strategies that you feel should be used to develop the country. So if we use an African view, then the environment is alive. And we should be living in harmony with it, interacting with the environment. Think about some of the things that many of the scholars wrote. When, I mean, not the scholars, the so-called explorers, Europeans, when they first came. They were commenting on the pristine nature of the environment. It was like paradise to them. And they were talking, they wrote extensively about the methods of food production that were being used. That were not destroying the environment. They were being used, they were methods that allowed for the 
living with the environment in harmony. The types of housing built here are the type of housing that are necessary for this given environment. It used the materials in the environment. So they wrote these things about what the environment was like when they arrived. Now look at the environment after 500 years of dealing with these people. And you see we now have something called environmental issues. When we say issues, we're talking about problems. They have to be dealt with when we are talking about developing ourselves. Now, because of the fact of all that we've talked before, that you now, this is now post, this is now uh, neo-colonialism, which means you had pre-colonialism, there was one whole different mindset, one world here, now we're in a totally different world here. And quickly, we want to look at what Nguzi Wationgo, in the book, Decolonizing the Mind, The Politics of Language and African Literature, just a quick piece of what he said the issue is all about. He says, I shall look at the African realities as they are affected by the great struggle between the two mutually opposed forces in Africa today. An imperialist tradition on one hand and a resistance tradition on the other. The imperialist tradition in Africa is today maintained by the international bourgeoisie using the multinational and, of course, the flag-waving native ruling classes. The economic and political dependence of this African neo-colonial bourgeoisie is reflected in its culture of achemanship and parity enforced on a restive population through police groups, barbed wire, a grown clergy, a gown clergy and judiciary. Their ideas are spread by a corpus of state intellectuals, the academic and journalistic laureates of the neo-colonial establishment. The resistance tradition is being carried out by the working people, the peasantry and the proletariat, aided by patriotic students, intellectuals, academic and non-academic, soldiers, and other progressive elements of the petty middle class. This resistance is reflected in the patriotic defense of the peasant worker, roots of national cultures, their defense of the democratic struggle in all the nationalities inhabiting the same territory. So he said that there are two different traditions going on here. And the rest of it, he gets into the deep. But there are two traditions. There's the tradition of imperialism, which we've looked at, and the tradition of resistance against it. That's two different mindsets. Because there's a scholar uh, who wrote a piece, and the book was published on it, on the African world economy at the University of Dar es Salaam. And he points out that the vast majority of the African peasantry Rural Africa has not been incorporated into the global economy. They are separate from it. Their focus is on domestic, life-sustaining issues. So that when you look at the international economic crisis, it really does not affect them. Because the traditional, the, the, our rural, in rural Africa, people are pretty much producing everything that they use. Everything that they use, they're producing, so when you're doing that, you're shielded from the international economy. So Ngugi is telling us here that there is a struggle still going on. Because now you have Tanzanians in control of Tanzania, but they are basically tied into the international ruling, the ruling classes in the United States in the UK and France. And you've got a struggle. So, when you look at the issue of talking about the environmental issues and development, you've got two different views approaching it. Uh, the other few weeks ago, I read some articles by Mihandwa from the pieces that he wrote. Well, Mihandwa is intentionally approaching it from an African perspective in those articles that I brought in where he talked about development and having to ground it in African culture. Whereas, in those same newspapers, you have other authors who are writing and they're approaching it from a decidedly imperialist perspective. But today, no one says imperialism. They say neoliberalism. 
They talk about uh, democracy, but they're actually speaking of democracy in the Western sense, which is the type of a, is a representative democracy, which assures that power is in the hands of the people in the ruling class. If you look at the case from Samir Amin, he tells you that the solution to the issues that are faced by both Africa and the Global South are uh, social and political democracy. He said social and political democracy. Normally, right now, you have what is being cast off as political democracy, but there's no social democracy. There's a difference when you start talking about social democracy and political democracy. He says you have to have popular national development. There has to be popular national development. Right now you have individuals who are going through universities at small elites who are leading the development. And very seldom do a small elite that are tied into the developing interests in the United States and Europe put forth ideas that are actually in the best interest of Tanzania, East Africa, African continent, global African people. So, what Ngugi points out to us is that we have to free our minds from those Western concepts and Western ideas. When you ground, when the mind, when our mind as Africans is grounded in African culture, then we can begin to clearly look at the issues of the environment and its relation to development because we have now chosen to define, define development in our own interests. We have now chosen to define the environment in our own cultural interests. In African culture, the environment is a reflection of the creator and we have to approach it as such. We are reflections of the Creator, so we approach it as such. And you end up then, when you do that, you end up with situations like what you have in Bolivia, where they, they write into the Constitution, into the legal structure, laws protecting the environment. And they wrote the environment not as a thing, but the environment as being alive. So now, we can now begin to get into the issue of environmental issues and development beginning with ecology. Now this particular book, Why They Are So Poor by Rudolf Strand, that I've been coming from for the past few weeks. Strand came to Tanzania and did the English language copy of this book, and then he breaks off by, he tells you in the first chapter, he is not approaching development from the typical development model. So now, this is a summarization of everything. He says, why is the environment in Africa threatened? He says it's threatened because by practicing monoculture, artificial irrigation, and using chemical fertilizers and pesticides, agro-industrial estates, plantations, cause impoverishment of the soil, lots of hummus, and soil erosion. Think back to the agriculture classes and you see what he's telling us here. The solutions of the agricultural and environmental problems. He is, now last week we looked at agriculture. Now in this chapter we're looking at the environment, but notice what he said. The solution to agriculture and environmental problems. You are not going to solve the agricultural problem without solving the environmental problems. They're connected. You're using the environment to provide yourself with a stable food system. How you use it is going to have a direct, how you use, what you use for agriculture is obviously going to have a direct effect on the natural environment itself. And that's what he's, that's why he connects the two. He says to the problems, the agricultural and environmental problems of the South do not lie in the resource wasting agro industry of the North. You cannot use the, the uh, so-called so solutions from the United States, from Europe, to solve the agriculture and environmental issues here in Tanzania. 
what they have done in the West has caused the environmental issues. Keep that in mind. The Western strategies have caused the environmental issues. Some of you are going to be, you're going to be lawyers, and you're going to be practicing in those forms of lawyer, forms of law, where you're going to be directly involved in land issues, resource issues. You're going to have cases where you're going to be representing either Tanzanians or someone else who's interested in those cases. They're going to be directly tied in to the state of the environment, tied in to agriculture in some way. So it's important that you have that connection here. Uh, these agricultural systems, well, he said the solution is in mixed cropping and agroforestry of the South. These agricultural systems work within the cycles of nature and only that can lead to sustainable development. Notice we have ecology and sustainable development. Because they want a type of development that can be sustained, that you can do for the next 10,000 years. Pre colonial African agriculture and environmental uh, views and strategies were sustainable. You have to remember. Something that gets overlooked in history class. When you're talking about traditional African agriculture, which was small scale agriculture, what we now call um, the agriculture that you find in the rural areas, in the West they tell you that's a backwards or it's an undeveloped form of agriculture. What you have to remember is that traditional African agriculture was the dominant form of agriculture in the world until 500 years ago. You went anywhere in the world and the primary form of agriculture outside of Europe was small-scale agriculture. A system of, a system of Kuji Tegamele. Self-reliance. Every agricultural system, when you go and look at the system that you find in Southeast Asia, in Vietnam, in Laos, when you look at the traditional system that you find in Japan, in China, all across the African continent, it was small-scale agriculture. A system of agriculture that provided for food security, that provided for nutrition, adequate nutrition. The system of agriculture that you see now, commercial agriculture, the agriculture that's being pushed by the agro industry. That is only 500 years old. Before the advent of that type of agriculture, you did not have the environmental issues that you have now. When we go out and we deal with the environmental issues that are occurring now around the world, they did not exist before 500 years ago. Did not exist. So, what do we mean by ecology? What are we talking about when we say ecology? Well, just think back to your basic science class, when you talked all about, you know, the, the whole, the human cycle, the life cycle. You know, and the basic example I gave was, if we went outside and we were standing under the trees, and you got the rain falling, we're participating in that natural, ecological cycle that sustains life. All right, so we're breathing out carbon dioxide. The trees love it. The trees take in the carbon dioxide. They're kicking out oxygen. We're taking in the oxygen. We've got a nice little circle going on. Now, the sun is tied in because the sun, through the issue of photosynthesis, helps the trees to produce that oxygen. Now, remember that oxygen is a basic ingredient in rain. So right now, we've got rain to follow. Oh, Hi, so wonderful. So you've got that oxygen now, the oxygen in that rain that is doing this part, you know, is the water itself in that natural cycle, which is, you see it falling here, it eventually drains off into the, the uh, water table in the ground, and then it feeds off into the rivers, feeds off into the lakes. So you've got a constant cycle here. And within that whole cycle, we've got a host of insects, and other animals that are participating in this cycle that we're tied into. That's the ecological cycle. It's pretty natural. 
Okay, so, now, we want a form of development that does not upset that basic cycle that we need. We need that basic cycle to live. We need a system of development that doesn't upset it. So we start off with tropical forests. Why do we need tropical forests? Well, we need tropical forests, first off, because that's where the majority of the oxygen is produced in the world is coming from. They have provided 42% of all of the oxygen in the world, tropical rainforests. The grasslands and the savannas provide 18% of the oxygen. Forests and other temperate zones on the earth provide 14% of the oxygen. If you look at the forests of the northern hemisphere, they're only providing 9% of the oxygen. Cultivated land, fields and pastures, once we've broken the land, cleared the land, broken it up for farming, provide 9% of the oxygen. And then when we look at deserts, tundra, alpine, pasture, and woodlands, we get 8% of the world's oxygen. So the tropical rainforests are by far the most important source of oxygen on the planet. Now the reason there's an environmental issue is because Western industrialization is predicated on the destruction of the tropical rainforests. So you can go to countries like Liberia and, there, and other countries that have massive amounts of rainforests like hey, because dealing with the issue of the uh, paper industry and all of these other corporations, those rainforests are now dwindling. The tropical rainforests are dwindling and because those rainforests are dwindling, that is having a natural impact on the issue of oxygen on the earth itself. So that's one way that Western development is affecting, negatively affecting the environment. So now when you have crooked elites or corrupt elites who are in government and they sign dubious contracts with Western businesses, they lack transparency, and they just wholesale allow the eradication of forest land across Africa, it's having a direct impact on human life itself. Alright, so that's one thing. Then, we traditionally are utilizing the rainforest, or we're utilizing these different um, sources of oxygen for the production of firewood in a very simple manner. That has an effect. All right. Then also, we have the issue of expanding deserts here on the continent. Sahara Desert is expanding. Something like the uh, an area the size of Uganda is, you know, is, um, two, uh, which is 200,000 square kilometers, is, big, is being a, uh, what's the word? eroded or destroyed. We're losing that type of fertile land which is now becoming desert on the continent. So that becomes another issue. <clears throat> now, the Western system of development, which is eating away the top of the rainforest, is also because of the way the uh, the industrialization that you have in the West, that's having an effect on what's called the greenhouse effect. And all we mean by that is that since 1880, the average temperature on the Earth has risen by one degree Celsius. In the same period, the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere has increased by 30% due to the various combustion processes linked to industrialization. <coughs> because Western industrial industrialization is uh, based on fossil fuel, the burning of fossil fuels, the burning of fossil fuels is increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. When we talked about the ecological cycle earlier, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide that's being produced by us and in other forms in nature was enough that the uh, environment was absorbed. <clears throat> but once Western industrialization occurred since just starting in the 1880s to the present, there has been a constant increase in the amounts of carbon dioxide in the environment 
And that increase has also led, that increase has led to some uh, destruction of the ozone layer through um, CFCs. The main ozone killers are CFCs, which are uh, product used as solvents for cleaning, for instance, in the computing industry. Other uses are as cooling agents in refrigerators and air conditioners. Uh, also in your air conditioners in your car. To make plastic foam for mattresses. And to use as propellants in aerosol sprays. And then there are other uses for CFCs. And now in the West, they've begun to pass laws to re the reduction of the use of CFCs and whatnot. But in places like, in countries like China, for instance, and in countries that are attempting to develop along the Western model, if those laws aren't in place. So there are things that I've seen on sale in the markets here, in Tanzania, in Egypt, in Ethiopia, and other places, that can't be sold in the West. Many of those Western multinational corporations are coming here and dumping on the African market items that they can no longer sell in their own home countries. Also, a monocrop <coughs> that is having a negative impact on the environment, tobacco. So we see the tobacco industry, we know the health, the health effect of tobacco, lung cancer, throat cancer, and other kind of cancer you want to talk about. Uh, but it's also eroding the soil. Because tobacco is a type of crop that does not do any good whatsoever for the soil. So, the greenhouse effect is a big concern. You constantly see the various uh, conferences sponsored by the UN where they're supposed to be talking about the reduction in the uh, pollution, in the emission of pollution. And uh, one issue that came up with Western businesses were concerned that. Uh, countries that were developing were going to be increasing their pollution, uh, <clears throat> the production of pollution, whereas they were going to be forced to reduce it, and they were talking about business issues. But the real issue we need to be concerned with is that the very Western model is detrimental to the environment. So if you follow Western industrialization, you're automatically going to increase, you're going to increase the uh, amount of pollutants in the, in the uh, atmosphere, and it's going to massively increase the destruction of the ozone layer and all these other things. All right, so since carbon dioxide is the most important greenhouse gas, you would think that you would want to reduce it. But if you follow the Western model, you're not going to reduce the creation of carbon dioxide. You're going to increase it. For example, cars are a massive pollutant. <clears throat> right now, the biggest pollutants resulting from cars are coming from places like the United States, Europe, China. Because, for the most part, Africa is still a continent where people are either on piki piki, bicycle, something like that. So, for the most part, you know, not too many people can afford a motor car. Yeah, not so much. But, if you figure that you've got a continent with a billion people, and then you've got, if only 300 million of those people now have a car, or 400 million of those people get a car, you're massively increasing carbon dioxide in the environment. So that is, this is an example of why you can't follow the Western model. It's not sustainable. Capitalism can't, is not a sustainable system. The Western model of development is not sustainable, and that's what Stram is trying to point out here as he's going through these issues. All right, now, another issue we have up here, monoculture, soil erosion, and pesticides. Well, if you look around, you, see, uh, the, you go to any place in Tanzania where the agriculture is being conducted by some agro-industry, they're so using pesticides. And the purpose of the pesticide is to kill certain pests that are harmful to the crop. The problem is that pesticide also kills certain insects that are not so harmful, that are actually needed 
in the environment. That becomes an issue. All right, now, monoculture, monocultures and agro-industrial farming contribute to soil erosion. Why? Without the application of natural fertilizers like farmyard manure, compost, and straw, the layer of hummus vanishes. So, when you go to a place and you see it's a giant field and it's planted with nothing but some crops, corn, doesn't matter what it is, that's monoculture. They are probably using 99% chance they're using pesticides. When you look at small farmers here in the area, and they're growing their crops, they're utilizing a sustainable form of agriculture. Think about it. Uh, if you go to most of some of the smaller farms around here, and you see that they have some cows, you've got goats, you've got lamb here, uh, those cows, those goats, those lamb, those donkeys are providing you with natural fertilizer. Every time they take a dump, that's fertilizer. You take that, you work it into the soil, you protect the soil, you've got the hummus, it's all wonderful, good, and well. <clears throat> when you're using monoculture, and it's just one crop there, and they're using pesticides, they're not using manure, they're not using compost, they're not using straw, it's destroying the soil. And what eventually happens is that soil, at some point, is no longer going to be able to produce anything. All right. More and more chemical fertilizers are needed in order to maintain crop yields per hectare. So then, because you're using these pesticides and you got this monoculture and you're destroying the soil, now you got to go and buy chemical fertilizers, which are once again poison. All right. So anyway, so that's another issue. Monoculture, they tell you that 25 billion tons of humans are destroyed throughout the world when you're utilizing the Western system. Now, since 2001, Western countries have had a land rush for African land. And you got crooks in the governments all across the continent who are selling off millions of hectares of African farmland for pennies to people in countries like Turkey, the United States, France, the Great Britain, why are they running to Africa buying up all of this farmland? Because through monoculture, through the use of pesticides, they have destroyed the soil in their own countries. What soil they had that could grow crops. So you see all these different countries, China, coming to Africa buying up farmland. They're not buying that land to grow food for the African population. The folks in Turkey bought up several million hectares of land in Ethiopia for agricultural production to ship food to Turkey for the Turkish population. They have used the Western model of agriculture have destroyed the soil in their own countries. And so now they're coming to the last place on the planet where you still have fertile soil that is able to produce food. Africa. And so now you've got the great land rush. You've got countries that don't have much in the way of agricultural land coming here, buying up the land. And that's leading to conflicts between the rural farmers and ag agro-industries. Because the governments will sell this development tool, they say, to you in this manner. So these countries, these are companies going to come in, they're going to produce jobs, they're going to be producing food for the market. All of this stuff is lies. All you gotta do is pick up a, book, a few books in the library and you'll see everything that they're telling you is a lie. Generally, what happens with these land deals is you have these companies paying off members of governments, paying them off with a bribe of some type, to push these crooked deals through. It's refreshing when you see a country like Tanzania or Zimbabwe where if you don't see that happening, Tanzania is just now beginning to have a problem. Only since the 90s. You didn't have a problem before. Everyone in the world knew from 1967 to 1985, you didn't even have to worry about going to Tanzania to buy land, talking about any of that food. It wasn't possible. A foreigner could not own land in Tanzania. Technically, by the law, a foreigner still can't own land in Tanzania. Technically. 
But now how is the law being circulated? Corruption. Circumvented corruption. See, Tasmania has laws in place that say, no. Nope. Matter of fact, when someone would come to get, was to get, the only people who generally were able to, were able to purchase land were those who were coming with the intention of developing the land in African interests, Tanzanian interests. Now, you have people who've been elected to government, or people who, you know, since 1985 to the present, who've been trying to circumvent that. They've been trying to rewrite the land laws. You as lawyers are going to be dealing with these kinds of issues. Because now, you have a, a backlog of cases in the land courts here in Tanzania, specifically dealing with these issues of these massive corporations clashing with the local Tanzanian. And remember, your job as a Tanzanian lawyer is to protect, protect those least able to protect themselves. You are not becoming a lawyer to become wealthy. That is not your purpose. If you become a lawyer to become wealthy, you might as well just go ahead and get your degree, pack up, head to the United States a year, and then go practice law there. They don't need you. We don't need those type of lawyers in Africa who want to get wealthy. You're supposed to be here to protect the interests of the people of Africa. First and foremost, as a lawyer. So as lawyers, those of you who go and decide to specialize in land law and land reform, those are the cases you're going to be dealing with. Because these folks screwed up their own atlas, their own environment, now they're coming here. And that's how they write about Africa in the Western press. The last pristine environment. The new frontier for Western development. All of that foolishness. Why are they coming here? Land. They want the land for farming. They want the minerals in the land. They are not coming here to help develop Africa. They don't care about any of us. And they'll tell you if you ask them. They will tell you. See me, I, I lived in a house with these people. I came from the United States. I grew up with them, so I know they learned. I see them walking around here, they be like so happy, and, and they be all so nice, and they even speak. And I'd be like, I'm not speaking to you. If we was in America, you would not speak to me. They won't. Look at what they say about Barack Obama in the press. The majority of white Americans, look at what they say about the man in the news. And he's not, he's, his, his policies are basically not in the interest of Africa. But look at what they say about him. He's pretty much continued the policies of George Bush, but look at what they're saying about him. So you can see what the issue really is. So when they come here, they're going to be nice to you. Yes. You want to be your friend because they want your resources. You want what's in your ground. They don't care about you. They want what's in your ground. They want your money in your pocket. And then when that's all gone, they leave. There was a movie in the West that the title of it was Independence Day. The point of the movie was these aliens came from outer space. They had destroyed their own planet, and so these aliens went from planet to planet, and they would go to a planet, they would utilize the planet's resources, use up all the resources, and then the planet is dead, and the aliens would go to another place. Now, when I was teaching in the U.S., I used to love to show the clip from the movie where the U.S. president is talking to the, the eight, one of the aliens. And he said, they're like locusts. They just go to a place, they use up all the minerals, all the resources, everything in the environment, and then the planet is dead, and then they move on. People, that is an apt analogy of Western civilization. They show up, your house looks so beautiful, you got a wonderful green land, when they leave, everything they dead, they just. Look at what they've done to their own environment. And that tells you what Western government's intention is. You've had certain African leaders who have pointed this out. Everybody from the independent generation wasn't a crook. Inyere pointed that out. Kwame Nkrumah pointed it out. Amilcar Cabral pointed it out. Lumumba pointed it out. These are from different parts of Africa. Uh, Sabukwe out of South Africa pointed it out. These people are after resources and land. That's their whole point. And now those are the people that the Western press wanted to tell you that they were evil, they were no good, they were this, they were that, they were the other. 
They were bad. And the ones that they tell you that are the good leaders, like right now they tell you, uh, well, God is just bad. He's harmful for heaven. Then they tell you that someone like, I can't think of anybody right now, but they pull up Kikwete. They love Kikwete. Okay, they didn't really care for me in the area, but they love Kikwete. Why do they love Kikwete? Start asking you questions. Why does somebody who used to be your enemy suddenly start loving certain people? Mugabe asked the question at an SADC conference. He was like, he asked the question, he said, why are you always going to America? All the time. I mean, America is coming from the United States, let me tell you, they do not invite people there who are in the best interest of their country. They constantly bring you in and smile and take pictures with you. That means they pretty much screw in you. In the worst sort of way. And so Mugabe asked that question. And a few other African ladies, they were pointing it out, they were asking that question. So look at these who these people point, push up, and say, okay, this is a good person. Remember, in your it said that Kikwete shouldn't have been president. I'm just quoting in your area. That's what he said. Kikwete wanted to run the president earlier in 95. He was like, no, you should run. You don't got nothing to say. nothing. He said a whole lot of other stuff. The only way he was able to run for president was when uh, in the was now an ancestor. So go back and look at what people, what your own folks have said about certain people, and then look at what they're doing policy wise. Don't get caught up on the speech. The speeches always sound good. Look at the actual policy, look at the actual plan, look at the actual laws, future lawyers that they're writing. That's what you want to pay attention to. See, when I look at the United States and I see Barack Obama go, oh, okay, an African president is all happy, I say it's not about the man, it's about the plan. What policy is he in plan? What is his policy? That's what you have to look at. That becomes an issue here because when you're talking about monoculture, soil erosion, pesticides, you are talking about policies. In this case, the policy of development. I don't care if you're a school teacher, development is your job. If you are a lawyer, development is your job. You're in a university teacher, development is your job. You're in tourism, development is your job. I don't care what you are doing, development is your job because you live in the country. And if the country is going to be developed, you're the ones that have to lead that development. Anybody else want to do it? Please. You got black people in America, they ain't no good in America. You don't want them here. You got black folks in the grid, this is They ain't no good there. They don't want them here. Everybody in the land, Marcus Zaga was saying, Africa for the Africans at home in the Bronx. Marcus Zaga even told you, look, some of y'all ain't no damn good in America. You don't be no good in Africa State. So, who's going to develop here but you? And remember, some, you know, we got some of our people here. We got, they got caught up in the Western lifestyle, the Western way. They want to do the Western thing. So now who's going to do the development? You think somebody's going to come from the UK and do it? Think about it. The United Kingdom took over Tanzania in 1918, 1919 after World War I. So from 1919 until 1961, they was in control of the country. Do you know when they decided to put the Western model of democracy in place? You know, with the elected um, parliaments and all of that? They didn't do that in 1919. They did that like in 1950 something. 57, 54, 57, somewhere in there. What were they doing the rest of the time? They weren't developing the country. You've got different scholars from Tanzania who've written a, a history. Your library got the books over there. If they don't have it, they can get it from the University of Dar es Salaam's library. The scholars wrote all the books, told you what these people did when they were in the country. What did the Germans do when they were here? They weren't developing nothing. They weren't developing you. So, what makes you think that their grandchildren are going to do it? I know some of us say, well, everybody's different. I'm like, no, oh, you know, if you come out of a given culture, this is coming from when you study, when you go to analyzing cultures. Cultures bring, people are the result of their culture. So now, you might look at something like Osama bin Laden, Adolf Hitler, 
and you and what Christopher Columbus and see them as persons. But remember, a person is shaped by the culture. So if a person is shaped by the culture, and you start to say, that, well, you know, some people are okay, I'm like, yeah, it is. The difference between the Adolf Hitler and the rest of the Germans was Adolf Hitler had claws and the rest of them don't. But you give them claws and see what happens. Then you say, okay, well, no, 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 that can't be true. That's, that's, that's not right. Just look at what occurs. When you don't have any claws, of course you're forced to be nice. But once you start growing some claws, then you know, you got the power now. You can do your own thing. The, the, the Chinese had no claws in 1960. They were poor just like anybody else. Now they're growing claws. Look what they're doing. They're pretty much following the same model that the West has followed. So if you have to start, you have to look at the, and that's what the college education is supposed to do, teach you to look beyond the surface into the heart, get into the ontology, get into the philosophy that underlies what folks are doing. Biotechnology, another issue. You know, uh, genetically modified foods, all of that biotechnology. Now, harmful to the environment. Not only is it harmful to the environment, these geniuses are actually trying to patent a lot of biotechnology. One thing about pesticides, too, is that when you spray in that pesticide, when you see it being sprayed on the crop, you know, and you see the person who's got to wear the proper stuff to keep from breathing it in, but once it hits that crop, it don't just kill that insect. When you eat some of that crop, you didn't. Pesticide is, it is a liquid form, so it drains on the set. The rain is falling, it's hitting the ground, and then eventually that water ends up, the underground water table ends up in the lakes, and into the ocean. Same thing with the pesticide, this is but it ends up in there too. That stuff ends up into the dietary system. It ends up inside of us. Because we are eating foods that are grown from. Not only that, we kill in the cows, or even if we're not killing the cows, cows are just eating the grass. Now remember that, that grass is now grown from um, when liquid that's been infected by the pesticide. Well, yes. You start having all kind of birth defects. You think people are, you think, uh, what is this? Take something like what a blanket per month dies of babies are dying and then you get a pregnancy. You think all the mother, the maternal, the infant, the maternal mortality rates is the result of a poor health care in the country? No. You got birth defects. Here's an example from Vietnam. The United States waged war in Vietnam from 1954 to 1973. They dropped more bombs on Vietnam than, than uh, all of the countries um, utilized against each other in World War II. All right, one of the things the U.S. did was they used napalm, and they also used the uh, Agent Orange. Because of Vietnam, massive tropical rainforests, a lot of foliage, a lot of greenery, a lot of places for the Vietnamese, of uh, the Viet Cong, the Vietnamese uh, guerrillas to hide and ambush the U.S. So what they started doing was spraying Agent Orange, which is a poison with uh, DDT in it, I believe, and it was Wiping out massive amounts of poisons. Alright, lots of poisons, poison in the food system, poison in the water supply. Now, here we are, it's 2012. And when they go in and test the areas where the US spray this uh, poison, it's still in very high levels of poison in the area 30 years later, and you well, 40 years later now, and you've got children who are born, who are born blind, who are born with massive amounts of water in their head, the expanded skull. You've got um, children who are, whose limbs don't properly develop. All of these different birth defects resulting from that poison. Why do I mention DDT? Because that's a primary ingredient in a lot of the pesticides that are sprayed here. Still the primary ingredient. Biotechnology, Still, no good. Because they're trying to, it, the, the idea, and it's sold to you in such a beautiful way. You know, they can produce artificial vanilla, artificial cocoa, artificial coffee. Now, the other issue is that 
when you start doing all these artificial this and artificial that that's supposed to mimic the natural thing, you get all the other artificial junk that come along with it. Suddenly you've got new diseases that can be cured. Kenya, I mentioned, I think I mentioned last week, Kenya just on, uh, I think it was on the 30th, 31st of November, they passed a law, they were not allowing any genetically modified foods into the country. And if you go Google, you'll see the news uh, piece. I was like, Ken, the Kenyan government did something smart. Several other countries have also outlawed the importation of genetically modified food. That's all the result of biotechnology. They don't know the health effects. Because you might think, oh, and they sold to you like, this is a drought-resistant form of this particular agriculture product. And it also has a lot of other stuff that it does to your economic system that either, that they're not just sharing with you. You got companies like Monsanto, these companies are out here selling you these foods, and they love to come and dump it on the, I mean, uh, dump it on the um, marketplace in developing countries, for sure. Go to, if you go to uh, Dar es Salaam and you go to some of the supermarkets where they provide you with all of those uh, microwavable foods you can see in the store, it's like a shop rack. That stuff, all of, all of those foods have a lot of, are the results, have ingredients that are the result of biotechnology, which is harmful for the environment. Because that stuff is bio, that's been um, genetically modified biotechnology. Um, Generally, it's resistant to the, 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 this stuff itself needs those chemical fertilizers to grow them, but not. It creates a lot of health issues. It's destructive to the environment. It's not something that can be utilized here in Africa. Not safely. Now, if you just want to be, you just want to do like some people do in the West. I know it's killing you, but I'm going to eat it anymore. And they say, I'll die for you. Eat it. You will die for it. Full stuff in the day. And now start looking at the U.S. now, and you see all kinds of, especially in the black population, you see a lot of different health issues directly related to all of this biotechnology. So, you got that. Now, what is good for Africa? The number one resource in Africa that is underutilized for the production of energy is the sun. We right on the equator. We got so much sunlight. It's just there. It's beaming down. You know, we, you know what? When I was in the West, I was in the United States, and I look up at the sky, you might see one star, maybe two. Maybe on a clear night, you might see ten. I come out over here one night when power went out for a couple of minutes, and I walked outside. I've seen the big, I've seen all these different stars. I was paying on one night and I said, so good. I said, I ain't never seen that stuff before. I mean, you're right on the equator. The sunlight is smacking you. Solar energy. And it's cheap. Solar energy is cheap, really, true. It's really, really cheap if you get out and start inventing some of the things that you would like it right here. But instead of solar energy, we're building hydroelectric plants to produce electricity and all these other things. And instead of developing solar uh, technology here in Tanzania, when you do see people are importing it from China, I mean, the Chinese are making anything solar, solar wide that you can make. And to be honest, I would just go and get one of those solar panels myself and reverse engineer it. You study how it's, what, what's the ingredients, how it's made, and you go make your own and mass produce it. What are the Chinese going to do? Accuse you of breaking a patent? That's what they do all the time. Chinese break everybody's back. Solar energy is a key issue right here. Some other renewable energies as well as solar. Because, I mean, you can't rely on coal and natural gas and oil or uranium. Why? The world, at the time this book was written, the, the, the edition I have was written in 97, the uh, world supply of coal only have about 500 years left worth of coal in the world. You only have 56 years of natural gas, 44 years of oil, 104 years of uranium. The oil and the gas are based on constants such as the current, the population of people utilizing it in the West pretty much the same. 
But now as you start talking about industrializing Africa on the Western model and increasing the utilization of that, then those numbers drop down. You can't depend on that stuff forever. Somebody's going to have to start developing some other field of cars. Gas ain't going to be here forever. All right, you've got the solar cooker, which has been invented. It's a wood saving stove. You don't need as much wood to use. Also, it's a solar cooker. It's based on the sun, so you don't really need electricity. All right, so that's one. Now, some of the technology you got biofuels. They've got a, 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 a plant, the Jatropha oil. It can grow anywhere in the Amazon tropics. You've got animal powder. I mean, animals, in the, there is nothing wrong. In your area, pretty much said it. They quote in your area in here. He said, what Tanzania needed agriculturally was oxen, oxenization. Start using oxen. You know, get you a couple of oxen, hook them together. Like my great, my, my grandfather in America, when he was alive, he was an agricultural farm. So, they had donkeys. Hook that donkey up to the, uh, to the, um, the primitive so called technology, and that donkey, the plow, that's what it is, the plow. And you, the donkey pull the plow along, you know, and then breaking up the soil with the plow, and the donkey taking the dung all the way along the way, so it's working with the donkey dung all in the soil, nice fertilizer. Grow all kinds of good crops. But uh, the thing he points out here is since industrialized agriculture is too energy consuming for a sustainable development, you need dry animals, oxen. Donkeys. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I'm, about, I'm already looking. I was going up about some land, get a couple of cows, get a couple of donkeys, and a couple of goats. I don't need to do a couple of land. That's it. They can reproduce and make some more. But the point of having the donkeys or the cows, that really mattered to me, was to pull the plow, break up the land, fertilize it, nice, wonderful, donkey soil. I mean, they do smell bad, but hey. You, you, you. Natural fertilizer of the soil. That's another one. Solar energy, you can produce solar cookers. Now think about it. You've got 12 year old boys in Malawi coming up with um, different technology, create their own technology. You kind of, you got a man here in Tanzania who, I know because some people think Western education is these things. This dude, he only got a form six education over there. No, he said form three. He said he only went to form three, but he built his own car in Tanzania. So, it's, it's just a matter of imagination. Whatever Einstein says, he says, imagination is more important than knowledge. Can I imagine it? If I can imagine it, then I can do it. Because, you know, if you can create the image in your mind, then your mind will take care of everything else. It's understanding the power of the mind. You've got wind power, windmills, driving pumps, electric generators, all with wind power. You got water power. Small hydroelectric power stations have good potential on perennial ridges. The small ones, not the big giant ones. Geothermal energy, using hot springs in volcanic areas, even to generate electricity. In Olkar in Okaria, in Kenya, the geothermal power station generates 30 megawatts of electricity. Right here in Africa, they're using some of these things. Alright, you've got the biofuel. You can take a lot of the, the um, mess that we throw away. You know, um, parachichi rhymes and the kitty rhymes, you know, just the rhymes. You know, because you don't eat the rhymes. It has to be used to break it, biodegrade it, break it down, make it some fuel. And, and utilize that as fuel. That's sustainable. Because you can constantly grow more tahiti and parachichi and, and indeed and not see the girl in that jump. You don't, you don't eat all of them. You eat what's on the inside, you can take the other side, break it down, it's biodegradable, turn it into a fuel, and utilize that fuel to run it into you, you divide the line yourself. Alright, so, anyway, these are some of the sustainable ways. Now, China, today, is following the Western model. But in 19, when they were, when they, uh, began in 1949, when they, uh, when the communists took over China, they weren't following the Western model. Now they are. But then, from 1948 to 1978, the Chinese put the emphasis on full employment and alternative ecology with renewable energy sources. You go to China, and a lot of those rural farms, and they still use pig manure to fertilize the ground, and a lot of leguminous plants, straws, stuff like that. 
That was the model they used for 30 years from 48 to 78. Only in 1978, at the end of the uh, Cultural Revolution, did they begin to switch to the Western model. But then also, Mount Mao was now dead, so the beginning of the switch. So that's the model you have to use. You can't use the, the Western model that just is understandable. And that's what Rudolf Schramm is pointing out in his book. He's like, the reason for the poverty, for the most part, is this effort to, to hook on to the Western model and get locked into the Western system. That don't do nothing but make us poor. Destroys the land. Pretty soon, we won't have to pay to their own. All right, so anyway. Once you, now, how do you, what type of farming do you use? It's what they call agroforestry. Now, agroforestry sounds like a wonderful Western term. It sounds like it's a new form of agriculture. Actually, agroforestry is 7,000 years old. Agroforestry has long been practiced in many parts of Africa, especially where the population density is high. When we say long, we're talking like 10,000 BC. Here are two examples. The Dogon and Mali plant leguminous acacia trees in a scattered fashion on their fields. Farmers in southeastern Nigeria have developed elaborate systems of mixed tree and crop planting that mimic the rainforest. In the west, they clear a whole land plant crops. The system the Dogon are using, the system used in southeastern Nigeria, is you've got trees and whatnot, you've got your crops planted within the trees. But we don't have to go to the western part of the Africa, we can come right here to Tanzania. The most sophisticated traditional system was evolved by the Chaga on the southern slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. Their method of multi-layer farming demonstrates that by recycling organic matter, you know, cow dung, and pig dung, and boozy dung, and goat dung, you know, all that. And the same plot of land can produce continuous crops without chemical fertilizers and other inputs. When I went out looking for land, I was look, I saw the land was clear, and I looked to see they had trees square, and then I was like, first thing I'm going back to do is planting trees. They already had some trees, but I'm on fruit trees. I like to build bad fruit trees, and I teach fruit, eat it, and I keep walking and play around and do whatever they want to do. And when you finish eating the tree, you just toss the rind onto the ground, and it's now fertilizer for your soil. But what you do is you have the trees there growing. Then you also begin to, you plant your crops right there in the midst of the trees. You don't cut down and get rid of the trees. You plant the crops right there within them. The trees are going to provide shade for your crops. They're also, uh, through the process of photosynthesis, they're adding to the fertility of the soil. All right, the soil never gets exhausted. On the contrary, its quality and its yields improve over time. Chaga farmers intermingle beans, spinach, potatoes, marrow, bay with coffee bushes, bananas, and coconut trees. In the west, you'll see one giant field, none but Indian. You see another tree, none but coconut. But the chaga, you mix them in. You don't just have one crop. First of all, you, I mean, if I just bought a bunch of land and just did corn, I'm probably going to be tired of eating corn. Seven days from the day that um, harvest comes. But you know, if you've got a mixture of crops, you've got maize, you've got coconuts, you've got bananas, you've got a mixture of crops, it's a better diet too. You get more ingredients you need. And this is an African system. These are several, this, is, this stuff's going back to 10,000 BC. Agroforestry. This is the type of farming we need. You know, you got your bouquet by your house. You know, have a bunch of different crops. You just grow one. Have a bunch of different stuff in your garden. Bunch of different things. That's agroforestry. All right. Then you also have alley cropping, where with alley cropping, it's like an intercropping system, and uh, you got rows of maize that alternated with rows of beans or cow peas. You know, so I might have right here a row of kiti. Right here, a row of uh, beans. Right here, a row of chai. Right, you know, you're growing different things in different rows because you are now aiding the soil in its fertility. That is the type of agriculture that will save Africa. That's the type of agriculture that will protect the environment. That is sustainable. 
that to fail. An example from history. In 1940, I, keep, I don't remember when the European Jews went to what they now call Israel and drove out the Palestinians and moved in. But when they got there, the land was pretty much dry and desert, they were saying, in large areas. So some people settled into some areas and uh, they, were, they were looking at the area and they're trying to come up with ideas for crops to grow. So they went back to the Bible. And they picked up, they opened up the Bible, and they were looking at the Old Testament, because that's all they used for them as the Torah, the Old Testament. And they were looking what was being grown then. And so they just kind of looked and saw people were growing this, 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 and this. Now, the agricultural experts said from the UN and whatnot said, that'll never grow there, and this will never grow there. The people for any reason they grew. Because that's what the land originally grew. Remember the African concept that we're tied to the land? Where do we bury our ancestors? In the ground. Their body decays into the ground. In African spiritual tradition, it says that their spirit comes back sometimes as different animals, comes back when we give birth to them, you know, they come back as we are the ancestors we want. It says you come back uh, through the children who are born again. You, have to, you know, sometimes people have that deja vu moment, like I did this before. I heard that before. Man, it might not have been you at this moment. Because we all are millions of years old. They have a scholar who was in the U.S., Dr. Amos Wilson. He was giving a lecture, and he said, and he said, you know, people are often shocked when I say that we're millions of years old. We're all the same age. And you say, oh, no. And you know, you probably think, think that you're a whole brand new person. This is the first time. But no, your genes are not brand new. There's only about 30,000 human genes in the world. Your genes, you think that you're so special that God made a whole new set of genes and made you. No. Your genes are a reproduction of genes that have been used since the very first woman and man walked here on the African continent and started getting together and making babies. Your genes are just a re, uh, it's just a reformulation. They got, these different genes got together and came up a little bit different than many of you. But those genes are millions of years old. We're all millions of years old. We constantly give birth to ourselves all over again. You know, some of us, some of you have children, your children are just like you do when you were that age. You think it's a coherent? You think it's just genetics? As genetics as understood in the West? No, it's something deeper going on here. So, in the African context, when we start to talking about development and the connection to the environment, you know, you're talking about protecting what you have here so when you come back again, you can see it again. But now if you get all greedy with the Western mindset and you start to, I only care about right now and what I see to be here and now, then when you show back up later on, you got to deal with all the foolishness that you've put in place. So, Agroforestry, solutions, popular national development, which means going back, we we'll keep going back to education. First off, you have to have a Tanzanian education that emphasizes Tanzanian values. Tanzania is the example for the African continent on how you take different groups of people and make a national culture. And you don't get rid of your own traditional issues, your own traditional, your own traditions. They maintain those, but still create a national culture. So you got to have a Tanzanian education, which means it has to come out of your mind, out of your cultural values. You can't just import it from the West to get your national schools. You just bring it in, people from the West, then they start bringing in people from the West, the people who've been trained in that method. Then you bring them in, and you wonder what the problem I'm going to solve, because you've got the same mindset. So what Ruji Matiyanko is telling us, as we look at solutions, he says our problem is we are mentally colonized, and we're mentally colonized through the language. That's why he says the politics of the language. We're colonized through the language. The language shapes how we see. Why are Tanzanians different from Kenyans? Because your national language is Swahili and their national language is English. 
There's a world of difference in languages. Because the language shapes how you think. And that's what Ingrusia was pointing out, is pointing out here. He says, for the patriotic defenders of the fighting cultures of African people, imperialism is not a slogan. It's a real thing that is occurring. He said, you want free, the freedom for Western finance capital and for the vast transnational monopoly under its umbrella to continue stealing from the countries of the people of Latin America, Africa, Asia, and Polynesia is today protected by conventional and nuclear weapons. Imperialism led by the USA presents the struggling peoples of the earth with all, and all those calling for peace, democracy, and socialism with the ultimatum, except theft or death. The oppressed and exploited of the earth maintain their defiant liberty from death. A key way to maintain that liberty is developing your own educational system. All of these things that you are seeing here in development, your lawyers, people, a Juris Doctorate means you now have a doctorate in the philosophy of law. It doesn't mean you have a doctorate in the philosophy of memorization of somebody else's law. When you have a doctorate in philosophy and laws in the context of higher education, you are lawmakers now. You're supposed to be presenting the original ideas. Actually, they're not original because you're supposed to be, your law is supposed to be grounded in your culture, and your culture is developed by your ancestors. And you see it in all, you see African laws in all of the Proverbs. You see African values in all the problems. That's supposed to be your foundation for the development of your law, for the development of your education, the mindset you want. Do you really want your children to look like the people you see in the images coming out of the West, in the movies and like that? So those are the values you want your children to have. If you are satisfied with your children having them, those values, then okay, that's all wonderful. Don't do nothing. If you like things just like they are, don't do anything. But if you want to change, and you want to help bring about popular national development, social and political democracy, you want those things, and that means you got to you got to get engaged in the hardest work known to mankind: thinking. That's what most people don't want to do. Thinking is so hard; most people just think, "Oh, that's just too hard. I don't even want to think about it." Thinking is hard work. That's the hardest work you have to do, is to sit down and think. But if you're going to engage in development and Tanzanian interests, there must be thought. And it must be African thought. It can't be U.S. thought. U.S. thought is just that, U.S. thought. It's in U.S. interests. And not all the, not the interests of everybody in the U.S., just the interests in the 1% of the U.S. population that controls something like 47% of wealth in America. Because that's who writes your textbooks. The textbooks that you get here to go to the library to see this book published in the U.S., that book published in the U.K. Look at the, if you look at the books themselves and you, and you start to follow the money, that's what I like to call them, follow the money. So, somebody had to pay for that book to be written. Well, who paid for those authors to be able to do nothing but write that book? When you follow the money, it always goes back to the elite in a society who have the most to gain from a certain thought process. So they write the books. So when you get those books over here, you may end up memorizing things that make them wealthy, but not you. So it comes back to education because you have to prepare the upcoming generations. I don't mean once you become a lawyer, I mean like now, when you age your name, you go to different middles, the different schools around here, and you start to take those children under the wing, and you start to modeling them for them, correct behavior, and you start to teaching them ideas now, so that they can get to them because that's the salvation. Because you remember, you're young, you don't know nothing is impossible. You think everything is possible. My mom said I made a scream once that I came to a care in the snake. Today you couldn't get me to go and pick up a snake and bring it to somebody. But she said, you know, when you're a little kid, you do all you don't know anything is wrong. And my dad said, said when I brought her the snake, I was holding it like you're supposed to hold it. See, when you're young, you're ignorant. You're unaware. Ignorant as an unaware. You don't know anything. 
So imagine when you take a young child who don't know any limitations and you start teaching them certain ideas. I have a young child here and I'm talking to them and teaching them stuff and maybe they'll be asking me what questions you want to and that, But I notice the mindset that is opening in them. Just by me just saying simple stuff. I don't even talk about it, these stuff, but the mindset is opening in them. They start to think, well, I don't think I should do this or wear that or do this. And that's their own idea, that's their own thought process. They went there for me saying something like, okay, what is that? I said, what's this? What do you use it for? Oh, I use it. Uh, oh, this is stone. What kind of stone do you use? Oh, I use it. I hold them when I'm praying, blah, blah, blah. And then they take that and go and come back with something totally different. They've expanded the idea. So it's your job to go back to those children. You can't just leave them in it. You can't just be, oh, I, I, I was there one. I'm supposed to go back and shape the future. You become the teacher. Not just the person who's getting undertaken in the classroom, but you. you your whole life you're going to be teaching. But the, the children who are coming along, they're watching you right now. You are their examples. Whatever you're doing, they're going to do. If they see you doing some unholy stuff, they're going to think that's right. And the thing is, they're not going to do just what you did. Think about it in a farming example. You take one seed, say I take one seed from a mango, and I plant that seed. Do I get just one seed from that mango seed? I get a mango tree with billions of seeds. I like the example of corn. You take that one kind of corn, you drop it in the ground, you put some down on it, you fertilize it, and you water it, and it grows. You don't get one kernel. You open up one of the, the stalks of, on that corn stalk, you just take off one ear of corn. You call it an ear for a tree. You peel back that ear, and you've got like hundreds of kernels. So whatever you're doing, and the example you're setting, they're going to take that example you set and they're going to multiply it. So if it's bad, they're going to multiply it in the worst one for people you've ever seen. If it's good, they're going to multiply it into the greatest amount of property you've ever seen. It'll be so righteous as it is Christ. So just take the example. That's the solution. We talk about saving the environment. If you teach the children, the child I've been talking to you about, we went and looked at some land, I said, what do you think about this land? She said, it doesn't have enough trees. I say, you're right, it doesn't have enough trees. See, when you put, when you just plant a little seed, she is just taking and running with it. You need, so, you know, that's what you have to do. That's the solution. The solution don't come from the government. You'll never get a solution from the government. The people in the government are there to protect their own interests. You have to get a bunch of people that think about wanting to solve the problem and tend to be an interest in the government. Which means you have to get yourselves in there. And you have to constantly be training the next generation. If I look up one day and see some of you in the book today, I better be seeing 15, 16, 17 kids with me. That's right. You shouldn't be in there now. You're just a big rig. You're riding around and you're, you're, you're over the unnecessary expensive vehicle and you're just stuff. You're supposed to have about 30, 40, 50 kids that you're working with. I mean, you should, I should see, you know, when they have the area, the area in there where the people can come in. I say, you should have, I should see them kids watching you in action. Because you're supposed to be setting an example for them. You become a lawyer, you're supposed to have 15, 20 kids with you. I don't know, one a month, one, one day a month, one day a week, you're supposed to bring up children in with you to see what's going on, how stuff works, and shape in the future. Even if they don't become a lawyer, you're going to have an effect on them, one way or the other. Either they're going to get the example of you being greedy and follow that, or they're going to get the example of you doing the right thing and follow that. And remember, when we talk about the environment, those children are part of that environment. So the example you said is the one you're going to follow, whether you know you're setting it or not. So why should you do it you have to? Because not only those kids that are here, but the ones that you produce, they're going to have to deal with whatever you do. Because you're going to pass all your bad habits or good habits genetically onto them. 
So when we're dealing with the anxiety, you're talking about an issue of values. When you're talking about sustainable development and protecting the environment, you're talking about values. Western values do not protect the environment. So if you want to protect the environment, you have to have indigenous values. That's why I brought in Melodoma so many. Which means we have to go back to our own African values. That respect the environment. They respect, they respect the environment. You've got to be like the, the uh, traditional Christians in Ethiopia. You've got to be like the Sufi Muslims in West Africa. They've taken foreign religion, but they've adapted them to this situation. And then they still maintain a connection with traditional African values. You have to adapt. You can't just take everything and just bring it in. So, all of this is a part of the environmental issues. And you'll notice a lot of these concepts, a lot of the topics keep coming back up. For example, we came back to pre colonial Africa when we started talking about agroforestry. We went all the way back to pre colonial Africa. So, there's no real cut, defined method for dealing with these issues. They all interconnect. All history is occurring in history. Alright, so, are there any questions? If not, I shall see everyone on the kitchen. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 